When I was seven years old, preparing for my first Holy Communion in catechism class, Sister Margaret Mary told us we should love Jesus Christ more than anyone else in the world, even our parents. I was a dutiful, obedient little Catholic at that age, but this imperative struck me as incomprehensible and utterly unacceptable. There was no one, not even Jesus, whom I could love more than my mother and father, the center of my universe. At 13, an emotional shift occurred. Not that I loved my parents less, but devotion to parents was replaced by devotion to the opposite sex. I became what you would call a serial infatuate. <laughs> Serially infatuated. Each year, beginning in the seventh grade, I developed a new, new infatuation. There were several conditions to this infatuation. First, he had to be a guy. And the guy had to be a complete stranger, someone I had never spoken a word to, like Jesus Christ. <laughs> Secondly, he had to possess a talent that put him at the top of his game and gave him visibility and popularity. Third, he either had to have a girlfriend or be a playboy. <laughs> Once those conditions were met, the drama could unfold. And this was the template. He, God. Me, a meek, self-effacing, no, self-flagellating teenager, prostrating myself at his altar, worshiping him from afar, and delighting in the agony of unattainability and a continual concoction of romantic fantasy. Remember, I was a Catholic. Weren't we all? Here are some of the more interesting highlights. Eighth grade. Dan Calverini, captain of the of the junior high school varsity baseball team. One school morning, I slipped a love letter signed, Your Secret Admirer, into his locker. Of course, I knew his daily schedule by heart and knew he would go to his locker just before lunch period. At that designated time, I stood a safe distance away and, heart thundering, watched as he opened up and read the letter. The next day, his girlfriend, Roberta Fogel, held a handwriting investigation in the school cafeteria <laughs> whereby targeted suspects, somehow I among them, had to write the letter E. When she discovered my E sample matched the E's in the letter, she approached me in the cafeteria, eyes glaring, snarling, you better stay away from my boyfriend or else. Ninth grade, Gary Wood, Principal cellist of the Long Island Youth Orchestra. The motto I constructed and recited from time to time was, I would with wood if I could, but I can't, so I shan't. Was I beginning to develop a bit of a sense of humor? Tenth grade, Greg Sustak, male lead in the high school musical Promises, Promises. Appropriate? I played violin in the pit for the, for the musical. After the show closed, I timidly asked him to autograph the Promises, Promises poster. When he wrote, thanks for making me sound so good, the arrogance of such a statement punctured my infatuation bubble. Mm -hmm. Summer after 11th grade, Lonnie Siegel, four years my senior, math major at MIT, and Long Island Youth Orchestra alumnus, he was my violin stand partner in the summer touring orchestra that traveled to the South Pacific. With Lonnie, I broke tradition and spoke to him. In fact, became friends. During rehearsals, he discreetly cracked jokes while I vainly tried to stifle my laughter. I fell for him hard. He was charming and clever and knew it as he flirted with one girl after another in the orchestra. After a concert one night in Pago Pago, the capital of American Samoa, I found myself, to my ecstatic delight, walking arm in arm with him along the shore. South Pacific, ideal romantic setting. Before I knew it, his lips and tongue were entwined with mine, a strange but soon extremely pleasant sensation. I often thought to myself, some years later, how lucky I was to be able to tell my grandchildren I was kissed for the first time on a remote moonlit island in the South Pacific. Alas, 
I never had those grandchildren. So here I am telling you instead. <laughs> but the story, unfortunately, does not end here. We continue to make out, as they used to say, and it truly seemed to this 17-year-old a dream fulfilled. No, I did not lose my virginity. I did not know from intercourse. Catholic upbringing, remember? Mm -hmm. And making out was an end unto itself, infused with romance, at least for me. When he suddenly rose and left, my heart sank. And the next day, when I was invisible to him and he pretended nothing had happened for us, tragedy indeed befell me. In this drama, could not confront him, suffered in silence. At 24, I entered the stage that would inform the rest of my life. I was lucky to find my balance with someone with whom mind, body, and spirit were aligned. The balance is in constant flux as the weight forever shifts and reshifts. Tedious? It's not. Do I know what love is? My father used to say that love is when each gives 100% to the other. Not very fashionable to say these days. Perhaps what he meant, and what I'm still learning, is by not taking oneself so seriously, the other's well-being becomes primary. When I glimpse moments of faltering vulnerability in him and in others, then yes, I am overcome by a deep, abiding love. Mm -hmm.